Welcome to the dawn of a new era for the human species, where smartphones and constant connectivity have become a part of our daily existence, and the human mind struggles to break free from this nonstop stream of stimulation. Now, as a clinical neuropsychologist, I'm trained to look for warning signs, patterns of behavior that could signal an underlying dysfunction in the brain. And lately, I'm seeing some pretty alarming patterns. Just by a show of hands, how many people have been tracking how much they're using their smartphones? A lot of you. Well, it turns out most of us are glued to our smartphones, often for over 40 hours a week. What would you have said if I told you 10 years ago, when smartphones were just coming out? that your full-time job would be spent interacting with this tiny little box a foot in front of your face. You wouldn't have believed me. We're the guinea pigs. We're the first generation exposed to all of this technology and the last generation that remembers what life was like before the Internet, before email and text and tweets and all this social media. And I'm really worried about the young generation, the virtual generation, who's been exposed to this technology their entire life. A recent review and meta-analysis concluded that at least one in four children and teenagers displays problematic and excessive use of their smartphone. And it's these children that are at the greatest risk of having anxiety and depression. But it's not just that. Over the past decade, suicide attempts by teenagers and millennials has doubled. Burnout has become so ubiquitous that the World Health Organization just added it to its international classification of diseases. France just created a right to disconnect law, so you don't have to answer any emails from work after hours. And it's not just other countries that are having problems. We're having problems here, too. The 2019 World Happiness Report looked at changes in happiness over the past decade and compared all the countries in the world. America ranked 112th out of 132 countries, just a few spots ahead of Afghanistan. And it's also affecting our sleep, and it's reducing our social interaction. I mean, isn't that ironic? That all of this social media is actually making our species less social. And it's become a problem. Japan has a negative population growth. They're so worried that there's online advertisement campaigns by the government imploring the young people to put down their phone and go out and procreate. Here we are, just a decade into the smartphone, and the warning signs are everywhere. A study came out in the preeminent journal of science a few years ago that I think really highlights the challenge that we face. It goes like this. In 11 studies, we found that participants typically did not enjoy spending 6 to 15 minutes in a room by themselves with nothing to do but think, that they enjoyed doing mundane external activities much more, and that many preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves <laughs> instead of being left alone with their thoughts. <laughs> Most people seem to prefer to be doing something rather than nothing, even if that something is negative. In 2014, the year this study came out, I was right in the middle of constructing a brand new laboratory. The whole point was to see what happens when you could disconnect the human nervous system from all of this outside stimulation. But in my experiment, participants were going to be alone by themselves for at least an hour. So when this study came out, I was a little bit nervous. And I wasn't just studying healthy subjects like this study. I was studying patients with severe anxiety and depression. People had been suffering for many years, 
sometimes decades, and whose nervous systems were in a state of chronic disequilibrium. You see, what I wanted to create was a tabula rosa for the nervous system. An environment that takes all outside sources of stimulation and brings it down to an absolute minimum. Where there's nothing to see or hear, nothing to smell or taste, no sense of touch or temperature, no movement or speech. And let's not forget, the brain does not exist in a vacuum. The tail of the brain, the spinal cord, is constantly fighting the forces of gravity. And in this environment, even gravity was reduced. Now, as you can imagine, most of my anxious patients were not very excited about spending an hour by themselves in this environment. They were a little bit nervous. That is, until I showed them what the environment actually looks like. Allow me to introduce to you an open flotation pool, an eight-foot circular pool with a foot of water. And in that water is 2,000 pounds of Epsom salt. It's a mattress of water. You don't have to move a single muscle to stay afloat. Now, the room built around the pool is soundproof, it's lightproof, it's temperature and humidity controlled. The patients have complete control over the float experience. They could get in and out of the pool whenever they want. They could have the lights on and off whenever they want. And because this was the first study to ever look at the effects of floating in clinically anxious patients, I was a little worried about the safety. So we created an intercom system so we could monitor every single float session and just make sure we could address any potential adverse events that could happen. So I'd like to share with you the results from our first few float experiments. The first study, we took 50 anxious patients across the whole spectrum of the anxiety disorders. We looked at PTSD, we looked at generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia. Most of the patients also had comorbid major depression. And we said, what would happen after a single one-hour float session? And I'm going to show you the raw data exactly as it was presented to me a few years ago for all 50 patients. In red is their pre-float anxiety level, and in blue is their post-float anxiety. Every single patient showed a reduction in anxiety. It didn't matter what their diagnosis was. It didn't matter if they were male or female. In fact, the people who went into the experience with the most anxiety showed the largest effect. Overall, the group showed a 14-point drop on the Spielberger State Anxiety Inventory, a highly significant effect. And when you compare this to a group of healthy, non-anxious people who also were floating for the first time in their life, take a look the post-float anxiety levels of the patients were reaching normative levels. In our next study, we performed a randomized controlled trial where patients either floated for 90 minutes or they watched a relaxing, neutral documentary, the BBC Earth, for the same amount of time. And what you see is, yes, Watching the documentary did reduce their anxiety levels, but not nearly as much as the float pool. And take a look, what is reducing even more than anxiety? Muscle tension. Think about it. All of that tension that we're harboring in our body, in our back, how much of that is driving our anxiety and stress? 
And floating is one of the few treatments I've seen that directly addresses this issue. But it's not just reducing symptoms of mental illness. Take a look on the left there. It's enhancing mental wellness. In fact, 75% of the patients said this was the most relaxing experience they have ever had in life. And it wasn't just during the float itself. There was a residue. We ping people's smartphones throughout the day after they floated and throughout the next day, just to see how long do these effects last. Take a look. Serenity lasted for an entire day. This group of people who was absolutely miserable coming into their float were left with a feeling of peace and serenity that lasted an entire day. Now, I should mention, this is just the short-term effects of a single float session. We recently received the first NIH grant to study the long-term effects of multiple float sessions. And in a few years, we should have that trial completed. Another th point I should emphasize is we weren't just looking at the subjective changes that floating caused. We were also very interested in what was happening in both the body and the brain. We spent a lot of time figuring out how do you measure things in this environment? We broke a lot of equipment, too. But we actually figured out how to do it. And one of the biggest changes we're seeing is in blood pressure. Take a look at this. Within the first five to 10 minutes of a float, you see a precipitous drop in blood pressure on the order of 10 to 15 points. And it stays that way for the remainder of the float session. And interestingly, the degree to which your blood pressure drops during the float is related to the degree to which floating induces that feeling of serenity. We also performed an fMRI study. In fact, this is the first time anyone's tried to understand what's happening in the brain <coughs> by the float session. And I was really fortunate because just down the hallway from my float clinic, are two state-of-the-art MRI scanners. And these giant magnets are able to see very minute changes in blood oxygenation within the brain, allowing us to tell which areas of the brain are activating. So we took a group of 44 healthy subjects, and we randomized them to either float in the pool for 90 minutes or rest in a zero-gravity chair for the same amount of time. And we scanned their brains before they ever floated and then immediately after their third <coughs> float session. One of the tasks we had them do was a reward task, where each trial, they could either win a $5 reward or get no reward whatsoever. And previous work with this task has shown that when your brain is anticipating a $5 reward, the nucleus accumbens, this region of the brain that's highlighted in red, a critical hub of the brain's reward circuitry that's replete with dopamine starts firing, starts activating in anticipation of reward. So let's see what happened in the two different brain scans. We'll start with the pre-float. What you see in both the chair group and the float group is an enhancement of nucleus accumbens activation to the $5 reward but there's no differences between the group pre-float. Post-float, it's a very different story. You see the significant enhancement of nucleus accumbens activity in the float group as compared to the chair. And the degree to which you see this enhancement of nucleus accumbens activity was related to the positive affect induced by the float experience. This suggests that floating is leaving your nervous system in a state where the world feels more rewarding after the float. So a single one-hour float session was able to take these stressed and anxious nervous systems and induce a reset that lasted for an entire day. That's pretty impressive if you could reliably reduce suffering in that manner. But how? How is this happening? Is there anything else coming into the brain 
when everything is being reduced? Well, it turns out there is. There's a rich signal coming from the internal world of the body, a concept known as interoception. This is the signal that's amplified during a float. The patients were reporting the spontaneous induction of meditative states, where suddenly all of their conscious awareness was focused on things like the breath, the heartbeat. They were able to disconnect from the outside world and suddenly reconnect to themselves. So as this new era moves into the second decade and our nervous systems are going to be inundated by ever more stimulation, I think floating could provide an antidote, a way to disconnect from all of this stimulation. And in fact, this is something you could try yourself because float centers are popping up all over the country. You see, the modern day nervous system craves disconnection. We just don't know it because we're so addicted to being connected that we become perpetually stuck in this loop. It's amazing, actually. What my research shows is that if you take a severely anxious and stressed nervous system and expose it to an environment that takes care of all its basic needs, an environment where it's not being constantly pulled and tugged in one direction or another by the contingencies of the external world, suddenly the internal world relaxes and all that stress and all that anxiety floats away. Our brain and our mental health is a byproduct of the environment in which we exist. Thank you.